Okay, let's look at section 1.4 about critical thinking. Some key concepts in this course are, first of all, that usually introductory statistics takes more common sense than real mathematical expertise. And that's partly because a lot of the problems you'll be doing and questions that you'll be looking at will be very applied type problems and questions. So this section is going to illustrate how common sense is used when we think about data and statistics. And one thing that I really want you to take out of this course is how to look critically at statistics that are given by people and organizations and in the media. And I really want you to leave this course at the very least an informed consumer. So some of the misuses of statistics. First of all, let's talk about voluntary response samples. We mentioned this in an earlier section. But when we talk about a voluntary response sample, it's also called a self-selected sample. This is one in which the respondents themselves decide whether to be included. And with a voluntary response sample, the problem with this type of sample is that the respondents tend to be those with strong opinions about the issues involved. They're the ones that are likely to respond. Here's an example. A survey published in a newspaper where respondents must either visit a website, call an 800 number, or mail in a form to participate in the survey. The only people that are going to take that much trouble to respond are people who do have strong opinions about the issues presented in the survey. We do see voluntary response surveys everywhere, magazines, newspapers, television, and especially on the internet. Just remember that results from these type of surveys are not statistically valid. Misuse number two is small samples. Conclusions shouldn't be based on samples that are far too small. But there's also a common misconception about this. An appropriate sample size does not depend on the population size. We'll talk more about this in Chapter 7. An example of a small sample size that we would be talking about would be a sample of, say, three people. On the other hand, something like a Gallup poll usually represents the whole population of the United States, or at least the voting population, and Gallup polls usually use about a thousand people. You might think from looking at that 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 was much too small to represent the whole population of the United States. Just keep in mind that in statistics, the size of the sample doesn't have to depend on the size of the population. You can have a valid sample even if it's a very small percentage of the population. So for now, just take my word for this. And we will only consider a sample to be possibly too small if it has less than 30 members. The third very common misuse of statistics is graphs. Graphs are very easy to manipulate and change to make them present information the way you want it presented. In other words, to try and mislead your audience. This is one place where you really should try to be an informed consumer. If you see a report in a newspaper or a magazine or on the internet that shows a graph, be sure to analyze the numerical information given in the graph. That way you won't be misled by the graph shape. We have an example here. These two graphs, side by side, are actually presenting the same information. But look at the difference in what they present. In the graph on the left, the scale goes from $0 up to $40,000. So the difference between these two heights is realistic and not misleading. However, in the graph on the right, notice that the vertical scale starts at $30,000 and goes up to $33,000. So it makes it look like the difference between these two values is much more than it really is. 
So the graph on the right here is misleading because of the way the vertical scale is used. Another misuse of statistics is in surveys that are given that either have loaded questions or that the questions are presented in a specific order deliberately in order to make a certain response more likely than the other response. Loaded questions are those that have emotionally loaded words in them. And again, these are designed to try and get a specific response from the people taking the survey. Here's some examples of loaded questions. Do you believe that gun control laws which restrict the ability of Americans to protect their families should be eliminated? The loaded part of this is where it's talking about restricting the ability of Americans to protect their families. Well, everybody wants to be able to protect their family. So if you answer this question in a way that makes it sound like you don't want to protect your family, that wouldn't be a very likely answer for you to give. Here's another loaded question. Should big oil companies be allowed to influence our senators and representatives with campaign contributions? The fact that this question uses the word big oil companies, that's a loaded term, and also it's talking about influencing our senators and representatives with campaign contributions. The word influence gives the impression that if oil companies give campaign contributions, then the senators and representatives are going to be more likely to vote in a way that benefits the oil companies. Another misuse of statistics is studies or surveys with missing data. And this is where we get into questions of how to select samples. You have to select your samples very carefully in order for them to be representative of the population that you're trying to study. So making claims about a population based on a sample that has missing pieces is another common misuse of statistics. Here's an example. A newspaper article reports that a majority of Americans disapprove of the war in Iraq, according to a poll conducted by calling phone numbers selected at random from 10 major metropolitan areas. So this poll is claiming to represent all Americans. The problem with it is that the sample was only selected from people with phones in 10 major metropolitan areas. That means that the sample really doesn't represent all Americans. For example, some of the missing data would be people in rural areas, people that weren't in one of the 10 major metropolitan areas. Also, it wouldn't represent people without phones. Here's another example. This was an article concerning an internet survey. This has to do with what parents think about their children and video games. What you need to think about here is what could possibly be wrong with this survey? In other words, does this survey actually represent what parents in general think about video games? The problem with this survey is that, as it says, it was an informal poll conducted by What They Play, which is a website about video games. This would be an example of a voluntary response sample. The people who responded to this poll are likely to be those with strong opinions about the subject of video games. And they would also have to be people who knew about the website, visited it, and had strong enough opinions to actually respond to the survey. If the poll is claiming to represent parents, that's also a problem because anyone could be responding to this survey, not just parents. So here's the actual website. And again, if we're looking at the poll that's on the website, anyone would be able to participate, assuming that they knew about the website, just by going there and answering the question of the day. So there's no control whatsoever over who answers the question, how many times they answer, the, a certain person answers the question, or anything else. And here's some other misuses of statistics that are given in the textbook, and you can read through the textbook about those. Let's talk about section 1.5, which is about collecting sample data. The key concept in this section, and this comes from the author of the textbook, that if sample data are not collected in an appropriate way, 
The data may be so completely useless that no amount of statistical torturing can salvage them. Meaning that if the sample isn't collected appropriately, then the data can be completely meaningless. First of all, some different types of studies and experiments. First, an observational study is done by just observing and measuring specific characteristics without any attempt to modify the subjects being studied. An example would be if the heights of all fifth graders in Cheyenne are measured, measured and recorded. Polls and surveys are also examples of observational studies. On the other hand, in an experiment, the researcher would apply some type of treatment and then observe its effects on the subjects. An example of this would be where the lung capacity of asthma patients is measured and recorded both before and after a new treatment is given in order to measure the effectiveness of the treatment. This would be an experiment because the treatment is being given which would modify the characteristics of the subjects. Now in the design of experiments, there are some key concepts. Randomization means that subjects are randomly assigned to groups. Replication involves using a sufficiently large sample. The other thing that needs to happen in an experiment is to control the effects of different variables. Confounding is a problem in experiments. This is what happens when the experimenter is not able to distinguish between the effects of different factors. Now, to control effects of different variables or factors, one way to do this is by blinding. You've probably heard about blind studies or double blind studies. Blinding means that the subject doesn't know he or she is receiving either a treatment or a placebo, so he doesn't know which one he's receiving. Blocks and experiments are groups of subjects with similar characteristics. If you have a completely randomized experimental design, that means the subjects are put into blocks through a process of random selection. And a rigorously controlled design means that subjects are very carefully chosen. Replication has to do with repetition of an experiment when there are enough subjects to recognize the differences from different treatments. So this also has to do with selecting an appropriate and large enough sample size. And when we talk about sample size, we do want to use one that is large enough to see the true nature of any effects. And we want to obtain the sample using an appropriate method, especially one that's based on randomness.